Section 17 of The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heavenly Footman. Footnote 1. Bunyan's sermon, The Heavenly Footman, was first published in 1698. His writings were collected in 1736, Samuel Wilson being the editor. Another edition in six volumes, prepared by Alexander Hogg, was issued in 1780. Another in three volumes by G. Offer in 1853. And another in four volumes by the Reverend H. Stebbins in 1859. End of footnote. Bunyan, 1698 born in 1628, died in 1688, in the army from 1644 to 1646, became a traveling preacher in 1657, arrested in 1660, and except for a brief interval, confined until 1672, in jail where he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, licensed to preach in 1672, and pastor at Bedford until his death. It is an easy matter for a man to run hard for a spurt, for a furlong, for a mile or two. Oh, but to hold out for a hundred, for a thousand, for ten thousand miles, that man that doth this, he must look to meet with cross, pain, and wearisomeness to the flesh, especially if, as he goeth, he meeteth with briars and quagmires, and other encumbrances that make his journey so much the more painful. Nay, do you not see with your own eyes daily that perseverance is a very great part of the cross? Why else do men grow so soon weary? I could point out a many that after they had followed the ways of God about a twelve-month, others maybe two, three, or four, some more and some less, years, they have been beat out of wind, have taken up their lodging and rest before they have gotten halfway to heaven some in this some in that sin and have secretly nay sometimes openly said that the way is too straight the race too long the religion too holy i cannot hold out i can go no further one of the great reasons why men and women do so little regard the other world is because they see so little of it and the reason why they see so little of it is because they have their understanding darkened and therefore saith paul Do not, you believers, walk as do other Gentiles, even in the vanity of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance or foolishness that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Walk not as those, run not with them. Alas, poor souls, they have their understandings darkened, their hearts blinded, and that is the reason they have such undervaluing thoughts of the lord jesus christ and the salvation of their souls for when men do come to see things of another world what a god what a christ what a heaven and what an eternal glory there is to be enjoyed also when they see that it is possible for them to have a share in it i tell you it will make them run through thick and thin to enjoy it your self-willed people nobody knows what to do with them we used to say he will have his own will do all what you can indeed to have such a will for heaven is an admirable advantage to a man that undertaketh a race thither a man that is resolved and hath his will fixed saith he i will do my best to advantage myself i will do my worst to hinder my enemies I will not give out as long as I can stand. I will have it, or I will lose my life. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. I will not let thee go except thou bless me. I will, I will, I will. Oh, this blessed inflamed will for heaven! What is it like? If a man be willing, then any argument shall be a matter of encouragement. But if unwilling, then any argument shall give discouragement. This is seen both in saints and sinners, in them that are the children of God, and also those that are the children of the devil. As the saints of old, they being willing and resolved for heaven, what could stop them? 
could fire and faggot sword or halter stinking dungeons whips bears bulls lions cruel rackings stoning starving nakedness and in all these things they were more than conquerors through him that loved him who also made them willing in the day of his power see again on the other side the children of the devil because they are not willing how many shifts and starting holes they will have i have married a wife i have a farm i shall offend my landlord i shall offend my master i shall lose my trading i shall lose my pride my pleasures i shall be mocked and scoffed therefore i dare not come i saith another i will stay until i am older till my children are out till i am gotten a little aforehand in the world till i have done this and that and the other business but alas the thing is they are not willing for were they but soundly willing these and a thousand such as these would hold them no faster than the cords held samson when he broke them like a burnt flax i tell you the will is all that is one of the chief things which turns the wheel either backward or forward and god knoweth that full well and so likewise doth the devil and therefore they both endeavour very much to strengthen the will of their servants god he is for making of his a willing people to serve him and the devil he doth what he can to possess the will and affection of those that are his with love to sin and therefore when christ comes close to the matter indeed saith he you will not come to me how often would i have gathered you as a hen doth her chickens but you would not the devil had possessed their wills and so long as he was sure of them o oh, therefore cry hard to god to inflame thy will for heaven and christ thy will i say if that be rightly set for heaven thou wilt not be beat off with discouragements and this was the reason that when jacob wrestled with the angel though he lost a limb as it were and the hollow of his thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him yet he saith i will not mark i will not let thee go except thou bless me get thy will tipped with the heavenly grace and resolution against all discouragements and then thou goest full speed for heaven but if thou falter in thy will and be not found there thou wilt run hobbling and halting all the way thou runnest and also to be sure thou wilt fall short at last the lord give thee a will and courage end of section seventeen Section 18 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. On His Proposed Removal from Office by Robert Walpole, Earl of Orford. Footnote 1 delivered in the house of commons in february seventeen forty one abridged among other things walpole was accused of having made himself sole and prime minister which at that time was regarded as an invasion of the rights of his colleagues the motion for his removal was lost by a vote of one hundred six for two two hundred ninety against it End of footnote one. Born in 1676, died in 1745, entered Parliament in 1701, became a Whig leader and Secretary of War in 1708, expelled from Parliament and sent to the Tower in 1712, returned to Parliament in 1713, Prime Minister in 1715, 1717 again prime minister from 1721 to 1742 it has been observed by several gentlemen in vindication of motion that if it should be carried neither my life liberty 
nor state will be affected but do the honorable gentlemen consider my character and reputation as of no moment is it no imputation to be arraigned before this house in which i have sat forty years and to have my name transmitted to posterity with disgrace and infamy i will not conceal my sentiments that to be named in parliament as a subject of enquiry is to me a matter of great concern but i have the satisfaction at the same time to reflect that the impression to be made depends upon the consistency of the charge and the motives of the prosecutors my great and principal crime is my long continuance in office or in other words the long exclusion of those who now complain against me this is the heinous offence which exceeds all others i keep from them the possession of that power those honours and those emoluments to which they so ardently and pertinaciously aspire i will not attempt to deny the reasonableness and necessity of a party war but in carrying on that war all principles and rules of justice should not be departed from the tories must confess that the most obnoxious persons have felt few instances of extra judicial power wherever they have been arraigned a plain charge has been exhibited against them they have had an impartial trial and have been permitted to make their defence and will they who have experienced this fair and equitable mode of proceeding act in direct opposition to every principle of justice and establish this fatal precedent of parliamentary inquisition whom would they conciliate by a conduct so contrary to principle and precedent gentlemen have talked a great deal of patriotism a venerable word when duly practised but i am sorry to say that of late it has been so much hackneyed about that it is in danger of falling into disgrace the very idea of true patriotism is lost and the term has been prostituted to the very worst of purposes a patriot sir why patriots spring up like mushrooms i could raise fifty of them within the four and twenty hours i have raised many of them in one night it is but refusing to gratify an unreasonable or an insolent demand and up starts a patriot i have never been afraid of making patriots but i disdain and despise all their efforts this pretended virtue proceeds from personal malice and disappointed ambition there is not a man among them whose particular aim i am not able to ascertain and from what motive they have entered into the lists of opposition i shall now consider the articles of accusation which they have brought against me and which they have not thought fit to reduce to specific charges and i shall consider these in the same order as that in which they were placed by the honourable member who made the motion first in regard to foreign affairs secondly to domestic affairs and thirdly to the conduct of the war as to foreign affairs i must take notice of the uncandid manner in which the gentlemen on the other side have managed the question by blending numerous treaties and complicated negotiations into one general mass to form a fair and candid judgment of the subject it becomes necessary not to consider the treaties merely insulated but to advert to the time in which they were made to the circumstances and situation of europe when they were made to the peculiar situation in which i stand and to the power which i possessed i am called repeatedly and insidiously prime and sole minister 
admitting however for the sake of argument that i am prime and sole minister in this country am i therefore prime and sole minister of all europe am i answerable for the conduct of other countries as well as for that of my own many words are not wanting to show that the particular view of each court occasioned the dangers which affected the public tranquillity yet the whole is charged to my account nor is this sufficient whatever was the conduct of england i am equally arraigned if we maintained ourselves in peace and took no share in foreign transactions we are reproached for tameness and pusillanimity if on the contrary we interfered in these disputes we are called don quixotes and dupes to all the world if we contract guarantees it was asked why is the nation wantonly burdened if guarantees were declined we were reproached with having no allies i now come sir to the second head the conduct of domestic affairs and here a most heinous charge is made that the nation has been burdened with unnecessary expenses for the sole purpose of preventing the discharge of our debts and the abolition of taxes but this attack is more to the dishonor of the whole cabinet council than to me if there is any ground for this imputation it is a charge upon king lords and commons as corrupted or imposed upon and they have no proof of these allegations but affect to substantiate them by common fame and public notoriety no expense has been incurred but what has been approved of and provided for by parliament the public treasure has been duly applied to the uses to which it was appropriated by parliament and regular accounts have been annually laid before parliament of every article of expense if by foreign accidents by the disputes of foreign states among themselves or by their designs against us the nation has often been put to an extraordinary expense that expense cannot be said to have been unnecessary because if by saving it we had exposed the balance of power to danger or ourselves to an attack it would have a cost perhaps a hundred times that sum before we could recover from that danger or repel that attack in all such cases there will be a variety of opinions i happen to be one of those who thought all these expenses necessary and i had the good fortune to have the majority of both houses of parliament on my side but this it seems proceeded from bribery and corruption sir if any one instance had been mentioned if it had been shown that i ever offered a reward to any member of either house or ever threatened to deprive any member of his office or employment in order to influence his vote in parliament there might have been some ground for this charge but when it is so generally led i do not know what i can say to it unless it be to deny it as generally and as positively as it has been asserted and thank god till some proof be offered i have the laws of the land as well as the laws of charity in my favour some members of both houses have it is true been removed from their employments under the crown but were they ever told either by me or by any other of his majesty's servants that it was for opposing the measures of the administration in parliament they were removed because his majesty did not think fit 
to continue them longer in his service his majesty had a right so to do and i know no one that has a right to ask him what dost thou if his majesty had a mind that the favours of the crown should circulate would not this of itself be a good reason for removing any of his servants would not this reason be approved of by the whole nation except those who happens to be the present possessors i cannot therefore see how this can be imputed as a crime or how any of the king's ministers can be blamed for his doing what the public has no concern in for if the public be well and faithfully served it has no business to ask by whom i shall now advert to the third topic of accusation the conduct of the war footnote the war of the austrian succession frederick the great had invaded silesia the year before the date of this speech and was soon to win the important battle of Mollwitz. and of footnote i have already stated in what manner and under what circumstances hostilities commenced and as i am neither general nor admiral as i have nothing to do either with our navy or army i am sure that i am not answerable for the prosecution of it but were i to answer for everything no fault could i think be found with my conduct in the prosecution of the war it has from the beginning been carried on with as much vigor and as great care of our trade as was consistent with our safety at home and with the circumstances we were in at the beginning of the war if our attacks upon the enemy were too long delayed or if they have not been so vigorous or so frequent as they ought to have been those only are to blame who have for many years been haranguing against standing armies or without a sufficient number of regular troops in proportion to the numbers kept up by our neighbors i am sure we can neither defend ourselves nor offend our enemies on the supposed miscarriages of the war so unfairly stated and so unjustly imputed to me i could with great ease frame an incontrovertible defence but as i have trespassed so long on the time of the house i shall not weaken the effect of that forcible excupation so generously and disinterestedly advanced by the right honourable gentleman who so meritoriously presides at the admiralty if my whole administration is to be scrutinized in a ring why are the most favorable parts to be omitted if facts are to be accumulated on one side why not on the other and why may not i be permitted to speak in my own favor was i not called by the voice of the king and the nation to remedy the fatal effects of the south sea project footnote the south sea bubble had exploded in seventeen twenty ruining thousands of families walpole became a prime minister for the second time in seventeen twenty one end of footnote and to support declining credit was i not placed at the head of the treasury when the revenues were in the greatest confusion is credit revived and does it now flourish is it not at an incredible height and if so to whom must that circumstance be attributed has not tranquillity been preserved both at home and abroad notwithstanding a most unreasonable and violent opposition has the true interest of the nation been pursued or has trade flourished have gentlemen produced one instance of this exorbitant power of the influence which i extend to all parts of the nation of the tyranny 
with which i oppress those who oppose and the liberality with which i reward those who support me but having first invested me with a kind of mock dignity and styled me a prime minister they impute to me an unpardonable abuse of that chimerical authority which they only have created and conferred if they are really persuaded that the army is annually established by me that i have the sole disposal of posts and honours that i employ this power in the destruction of liberty and the diminution of commerce let me awaken them from their delusion let me expose to their view the real condition of the public will let me show them that the crown has made no encroachments that all supplies have been granted by parliament that all questions have been debated with the same freedom as before the fatal period in which my counsels are said to have gained the ascendancy an ascendancy from which they deduce the loss of trade the approach of slavery the preponderance of prerogative and the extension of influence but i am far from believing that they feel those apprehensions which they so earnestly labor to communicate to others and i have too high an opinion of their sagacity not to conclude that even in their own judgment they are complaining of grievances that they do not suffer and promoting rather their private interest than that of the public what is this unbounded sole power which is imputed to me how has it discovered itself or how has it been proved what have been the effects of the corruption ambition and avarice which i am so abundantly charged have i ever been suspected of being corrupted a strange phenomenon a corrupter himself not corrupt is ambition imputed to me why then do i still continue a commoner i who refused a white staff and a peerage i had indeed like to have forgotten the little ornament about my shoulders the garter which gentlemen have so repeatedly mentioned in terms of sarcastic obloquy but surely though this may be regarded with envy or indignation in another place it cannot be supposed to raise any resentment in this house where many may be pleased to see those honours which their ancestors have worn restored again to the commons have i given any symptoms of an avaricious disposition have i obtained any grants from the crown since i have been placed at the head of the treasury has my conduct been different from that which others in the same station would have followed have i acted wrong in giving the place of auditor to my son and in providing for my own family i trust that their advancement will not be imputed to me as a crime unless it shall be proved that i placed them in offices of trust and responsibility for which they were unfit but while i unequivocally deny that i am sole and prime minister and that to my influence and direction all the measures of the government must be attributed yet i will not shrink from the responsibility which attaches to the post i have the honour to hold and should during the long period in which i have sat upon this bench any one step taken by government be proved to be either disgraceful or disadvantageous to the nation i am ready to hold myself accountable to conclude sir though i shall always be proud of the honour of any trust or confidence from his majesty yet i shall always be ready to remove from his counsels and presence when he thinks fit and therefore i should think myself very little concerned 
in the event of the present question if it were not for the encroachment that will thereby be made upon the prerogatives of the crown but i must think that an address to his majesty to remove one of his servants without so much as alleging any particular crime against him is one of the greatest encroachments that was ever made upon the prerogatives of the crown and therefore for the sake of my master without any regard for my own i hope all those that have a due regard for our constitution and for the rights and prerogatives of the crown without which our constitution cannot be preserved will be against this motion end of section eighteen section nineteen of the world's famous orations volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's famous orations volume three against the gin bill of the ministry by philip dormer stanhope earl of chesterfield footnote delivered in the house of lords february fifteenth seventeen forty three abridged the carteret gin bill altered the duties on spirituous liquors and granted licenses to retailers dr johnson contributed a report of this speech to the gentleman's magazine for november seventeen forty three and claimed in the main to have composed the speech himself for a period of about two years johnson in this way reported parliamentary speeches for the gentleman's magazine notes of speeches were made for him by persons employed to do so and from these notes he composed the speeches to whomever credit belongs for this speech it remains a charming specimen of the best english of the period in footnote born in sixteen ninety four died in seventeen seventy three having occupied several diplomatic positions served as lord lieutenant of ireland in seventeen forty four to seventeen forty six his letters to his son published after his death in seventeen seventy four were not written for publication seventeen forty three the bill now under our consideration appears to me to deserve a much closer regard than seems to have been paid to it in the other house through which it was hurried with the utmost precipitation and where it passed almost without the formality of a debate nor can i think that earnestness with which some lords seemed inclined to press it forward here consistent with the importance of the consequences which may with great reason be expected from it to desire my lords that this bill may be considered in a committee is only to desire that it may gain one step without opposition that it may proceed through the forms of the house by stealth and that the consideration of it may be delayed till the exigencies of the government shall be so great as to not allow time for raising the supplies by any other method by this artifice gross as it is the patrons of this wonderful bill hope to obstruct a plain and open detection of its tendency they hope my lords that the bill shall operate in the same manner with the liquor which it is intended to bring into more general use and that as those who drink spirits are drunk before they are well aware that they are drinking the effects of this law shall be perceived before we know that we have made it their intent is to give us a dram of policy which is to be swallowed before it is tasted and which when once it is swallowed will turn our heads to pretend my lords that the design of this bill is to prevent or diminish the use of spirits is to trample on common sense and to violate the rules of decency as well as of reason for when did any man hear that a commodity was prohibited by licensing its sale or that to offer and refuse is the same action it is indeed pleaded that it will be made dearer by the tax which is proposed and that the increase of the price will diminish the number of purchasers but it is at the same time expected that this tax shall supply the expense of a war on the continent it is asserted therefore that the consumption of spirits will be hindered and yet that it will be such as may be expected to furnish from a very small tax a revenue sufficient for the support of armies or the re-establishment of the austrian family and the repressing of the attempts of france footnote only a few months before the date of this speech frederick the great by treaty had finally wrested silesia from maria theresa End footnote. surely my lords these expectations are not very consistent 
nor can it be imagined that they are both formed in the same head, though they may be expressed by the same mouth. It is, however, some recommendation of a statesman when of his assertions one can be found reasonable or true, and in this praise cannot be denied to our present ministers. For though it is undoubtedly false that this tax will lessen the consumption of spirits, it is certainly true that it will produce a very large revenue, a revenue that will not fail but with the people from whose debaucheries it arises. Our ministers will therefore have the same honor with their predecessors, of having given rise to a new fund, not indeed for the payment of our debts, but for much more valuable purposes, for the cheering of our hearts under oppression, and for the ready support of those debts which we have lost all hopes of paying. They are resolved, my lords, that the nation which no endeavors can make wise shall, while they are at its head, at least be made very merry. And since public happiness is the end of government, they seem to imagine that they shall deserve applause by an expedient which will enable every man to lay his cares to sleep, to drown sorrow, and lose in the delights of drunkenness both the public miseries and his own. Luxury, my lords, is to be taxed, but vice prohibited. Let the difficulties in executing the law be what they will. Would you lay a tax on the breach of the Ten Commandments? Would not such a tax be wicked and scandalous, because it would imply an indulgence to all those who would pay the tax? Is this not a reproach most justly thrown by the Protestants upon the Church of Rome? Was it not the chief cause of the Reformation? And will you follow a precedent which brought reproach and ruin upon those that introduced it? This is the very case now before you. You are going to lay a tax, and consequently to indulge a sort of drunkenness, which almost necessarily produces a breach of every one of the Ten Commandments. Can you expect the Reverend Bench will approve of this? I am convinced they will not, and therefore I wish I had seen it full upon this occasion. I am sure I have seen it much fuller upon other occasions in which religion had no such deep concern. Surely, my lords, men of such unbounded benevolence as our present ministers deserve such honors as were never paid before. They deserve to bestride a bud upon every signpost in the city, or to have their figures exhibited as tokens where this liquor is to be sold by the license which they have procured. They must at least be remembered to future ages as the happy politicians, who, after all expedients for raising taxes had been employed, discovered a new method of draining the last relics of the public wealth, and adding a new revenue to the government. Nor will those who shall hereafter enumerate the several funds now established among us forget, among the benefactors to their country, the illustrious authors of the Drinking Fund. May I be allowed, my lords, to congratulate my countrymen and my fellow subjects upon the happy times which are now approaching, in which no man will be disqualified from the privilege of being drunk, when all discontent and disloyalty shall be forgotten, and the people, though now acknowledged by the ministry as enemies, shall acknowledge the leniency of that government under which all restraints are taken away. But to a bill for such desirable purposes it would be proper, my lords, to prefix a preamble, in which the kindness of our intentions should be more fully explained, that the nation may not mistake our indulgence for cruelty, not consider their benefactors as their persecutors. If, therefore, this bill be considered and amended, for why else should it be considered? In a committee, I shall humbly propose that it shall be introduced in this manner. Whereas the designs of the present ministry, whatever they are, cannot be executed without a great number of mercenaries, which mercenaries cannot be hired without money, and whereas the present disposition of this nation to drunkenness inclines us to believe that they will pay more cheerfully for the undisturbed enjoyment of distilled liquors than for any other concession that can be made by the government, being enacted by the King's most excellent majesty, that no man shall hereafter be denied the right of being drunk on the following conditions. The noble lord has indeed admitted that this bill may not be found sufficiently coercive, but gives us hope that it may be improved and enforced another year, and persuades us to endeavor a reformation of drunkenness by degrees, and above all to beware at present of hurting the manufacturer. I am very far, my lords, from thinking that there are this year any peculiar reasons for tolerating murder nor can I conceive why the manufacture should be held sacred now, if it is to be destroyed hereafter. We are indeed desired to try how far this law will operate, that we may be more able to proceed with due regard to this valuable manufacture. 
With regard to the operation of the law, it appears to me that it will only enrich the government without reforming the people, and I believe there are not many of a different opinion. If any diminution of the sale of spirits be expected from it, it is to be considered that this diminution will or will not be such as is desired for the reformation of the people. If it be sufficient, the manufacture is at an end, and all reasons against the higher duties are of equal force against this. But if it be not sufficient, we have at least omitted part of our duty, and have neglected the health and virtue of the people. When I consider, my lords, the tendency of this bill, I find it calculated only for the propagation of diseases, the suppression of industry, and the destruction of mankind. I find it the most fatal engine that ever was pointed at a people, an engine by which those who are not killed will be disabled, and those who preserve their limbs will be deprived of their senses. This bill, therefore, appears to be designed only to thin the ranks of mankind and to disburden the world of the multitudes that inhabit it, and is perhaps the strongest proof of political sagacity that our new ministers have yet exhibited. They well know, my lords, that they are universally detested, and that whenever a Briton is destroyed they are freed from an enemy. They have therefore opened the floodgates of gin upon the nation that when it is less numerous it may be more easily governed. Other ministers, my lords, who had not attained to so great a knowledge in the art of making war upon their country, when they found their enemies clamorous and bold, used to awe them with prosecutions and penalties, or destroy them like burglars with prisons and with gibbets. But every age, my lord, produces some improvement, and every nation, however degenerate, gives birth at some happy period of time to men of great and enterprising genius. It is our fortune to be witnesses of a new discovery in politics. We may congratulate ourselves upon being contemporaries with those men who have shown that hangmen and halters are unnecessary in a state, and that ministers may escape the reproach of destroying their enemies by inciting them to destroy themselves. For this purpose, my lords, what could have been invented more efficacious than an establishment of a certain number of shops at which poison may be vended, poison so prepared as to please the palate, while it wastes the strength and only kills by intoxication? From the first instant that any of the enemies of the ministry shall grow clamorous and turbulent, a crafty hireling may lead him to the ministerial slaughterhouse and ply him with their wonder-working liquor, till he is no longer able to speak or think. And, my lords, no man can be more agreeable to our ministers that he can neither speak nor think, except those who speak without thinking. End of section 19. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 20 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. God's Love to Fallen Man by John Wesley. Footnote. A sermon from the text, Not as the transgression, so is the free gift. Romans 5.15 Wesley's sermon to the number of 141, covering the period 1726-90, to 90, have been published. His works were first collected by himself in 32 volumes in 1771-74. to 74. End footnote. Born in 1703, died in 1791, educated at Oxford became at Oxford in 1729 the leader of a band of young men who founded Methodism, visited Georgia as a missionary in 1735, began open-air preaching in England in 1739, held the first Methodist conference in 1744. How exceedingly common and how bitter is the outcry against our first parent for the mischief which he not only brought upon himself, but entailed upon his latest posterity. It was by his willful rebellion against God that sin entered into the world. By one man's disobedience, as the Apostle observes, the many, as many as were then in the loins of their forefathers, were made, or constituted, sinners, not only deprived of the favor of God, but also of his image, of all virtue, righteousness, and true holiness, and sunk partly into the image of the devil, in pride, malice, and all other diabolical tempers partly into the image of the brute, being fallen under the dominion of brutal passions and groveling appetites. Hence also death entered into the world with all its forerunners and attendants, 
pain sickness and a whole train of uneasy as well as unholy passions and tempers for all this we may thank adam has been echoed down from generation to generation it were well if the charge rested here but it is certain it does not it cannot be denied that it frequently glances from adam to his creator have not thousands even of those that are called christians taken the liberty to call his mercy if not his justice also into question on this very account some indeed have done this a little more modestly in an oblique and indirect manner but others have thrown aside the mask and asked did not god foresee that adam would abuse his liberty and did he not know the baneful consequences which this must naturally have on all his posterity and why then did he permit that disobedience was it not easy for the almighty to have prevented it he certainly did foresee the whole this cannot be denied mankind in general have gained by the fall of adam a capacity of attaining more holiness and happiness on earth than it would have been possible for them to attain if adam had not fallen for if adam had not fallen christ had not died nothing can be more clear than this nothing more undeniable the more thoroughly we consider the point the more deeply shall we be convinced of it unless all the partakers of human nature had received that deadly wound in adam it would not have been needful for the son of god to take our nature upon him do you not see that this was the very ground of his coming into the world by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and thus death passed upon us all through him in whom all men sinned was it not to remedy this very thing that the word was made flesh that as in adam all died so in christ all might be made alive unless then many had been made sinners by the disobedience of one by the obedience of one many would not have been made righteous so there would have been no room for that amazing display of the son of god's love to mankind there would have been no occasion for his being obedient unto death even the death of the cross it could not then have been said to the astonishment of all the hosts of heaven god so loved the world yea the ungodly world which had no thought or desire of returning to him that he gave his son out of his bosom his only begotten son to the end that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life what is the necessary consequence of this it is this there could then have been no such thing as faith in god thus loving the world giving his only son for us men and for our salvation there could have been no such thing as faith in the son of god as loving us and giving himself for us there could have been no faith in the spirit of god as renewing the image of god in our hearts as raising us from the death of sin unto the life of righteousness indeed the whole privilege of justification by faith could have no existence there could have been no redemption in the blood of christ neither could christ have been made of god unto us either wisdom righteousness sanctification or redemption and the same grand blank which was in our faith must likewise have been in our love we might have loved the author of our being the father of angels and men as our creator and preserver we might have said o lord our governor how excellent is thy name in all the earth but we could not have loved him under the nearest and dearest relation as delivering up his son for us all we might have loved the son of god as being the brightness of his father's glory the express image of his person although this ground seems to belong rather to the inhabitants of heaven than earth but we could not have loved him as bearing our sins in his own body on the tree and by that one oblation of himself once offered making full oblation sacrifice and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world we could not have been made conformable to his death not have known the power of his resurrection and as our faith both in god the father and the son receives an unspeakable increase if not its very being from this grand event as does also our love both of the father and the son so does also our love of our neighbor also our benevolence to all mankind which cannot but increase in the same proportion with our faith and love of god for who does not apprehend the force of that inference drawn by the loving apostle beloved if god so loved us we ought also to love one another 
such gainers may we be by adam's fall with regard both to the love of god and of our neighbor but there is another grand point which though little adverted to deserves our deepest consideration by that one act of our first parent not only sin entered the world but pain also and was alike entailed on his whole posterity and herein appeared not only the justice but the unspeakable goodness of god for how much good does he continually bring out of this evil how much holiness and happiness out of pain how innumerable are the benefits which god conveys to the children of men through the channel of sufferings so that it might well be said what are termed afflictions in the language of men are in the language of god styled blessings indeed had there been no suffering in the world a considerable part of religion yea and in some respects the most excellent part could have had no place therein since the very existence of it depends on our suffering so that had there been no pain it could have had no being upon this foundation even our suffering it is evident all our passive graces are built yea the noblest of all christian graces love enduring all things what room could there be for trust in god if there was no such thing as pain or danger who might not say then the cup which my father had given me shall i not drink it it is by sufferings that our faith is tried and therefore made more acceptable to god it is in the day of trouble that we have occasion to say though he slay me yet will i trust in him this is well pleasing to god that we own him in the face of danger in defiance of sorrow sickness pain or death again had there been neither natural nor moral evil in the world what must have become of patience meekness gentleness long-suffering it is manifested they could have had no being seeing all these have evil for their object if therefore evil had never entered into the world neither could these have had any place in it for who could have returned good for evil had there been no evil doer in the universe how had it been possible on that supposition to overcome evil with good it is then we shall be enabled fully to comprehend not only the advantages which accrue at the present time to the sons of men by the fall of their first parent but the infinitely greater advantages which they may reap from it in eternity in order to form some conception of this we may remember the observation of the apostle as one star differeth from another star in glory so also is the resurrection of the dead the most glorious stars will undoubtedly be those who are the most holy who bear most of that image of god wherein they were created the next in glory to these will be those who have been most abundant in good works and next to them those that have suffered most according to the will of god but what advantages in every one of these respects will the children of god receive in heaven by god's permitting the introduction of pain upon the earth in consequence of sin by occasion of this they attained many holy tempers which otherwise could have had no being resignation to god confidence in him in times of trouble and danger patience meekness gentleness long-suffering and the whole train of passive virtues and on account of this superior holiness they will then enjoy superior happiness there is one advantage more that we reap from adam's fall which is not unworthy our attention unless in adam all had died being in the loins of their first parent every descendant of adam every child of man must have personally answered for himself to god it seems to be a necessary consequence of this that if he had once fallen once violated any command of god there would have been no help possibly of his rising again there was no help but he must have perished without remedy for that covenant knew not to show mercy the word was the soul that sinneth it shall die now who would not rather be on the footing he is now under a covenant of mercy who would wish to hazard a whole eternity upon one stake is it not infinitely more desirable to be in a state wherein though encompassed with infirmities yet we do not run such a desperate risk but if we fall we may rise again see then upon the whole how little reason we have to repine at the fall of our first parent since herefrom we may derive such unspeakable advantages both in time and eternity see how small pretense there is for questioning the mercy of god in permitting that event to take place since therein mercy by infinite degrees rejoices over judgment where then is the man that presumes to blame god for not preventing adam's sin 
should we not rather bless him from the ground of the heart for therein laying the grand scheme of man's redemption and making way for that glorious manifestation of his wisdom holiness justice and mercy if indeed god had decreed before the foundation of the world that millions of men should dwell in everlasting burnings because adam sinned hundreds or thousands of years before they had a being i know not who could thank him for this unless the devil and his angels seeing on this supposition all those millions of unhappy spirits would be plunged into hell by adam's sin without any possible advantage from it but blessed be god this is not the case such a decree never existed on the contrary every one born of woman may be unspeakable gainer thereby no one ever was or can be loser but by choice end of section twenty section twenty one of the world's famous orations volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's famous orations volume three george whitfield on the method of grace footnote abridged whitfield's sermons is preached number over eighteen thousand he published sixty-three in his own lifetime, forty-six having appeared before he was twenty-five years of age. Eighteen others were printed from shorthand notes without revision. Whitfield's works in six volumes edited by John Gillies were published in 1771-1772. Born in 1714, died in 1770, associated with the beginnings of Methodism at Oxford. Visited America in 1738. 1739, 1744, 1748, and 1769, separated from Wesley in 1741. As God can send a nation or people no greater blessing than to give them faithful, sincere, and upright ministers, so the greatest curse that God can possibly send upon a people in this world is to give them over to blind, unregenerate, carnal, lukewarm, and unskillful guides. And yet in all ages we find that there have been many wolves in sheep's clothing, many that daubed with untempered mortar, that prophesied smoother things than God did allow. As it was formerly, so it is now. There are many that corrupt the word of God and deal deceitfully with it. It was so in a special manner in the prophet Jeremiah's time, and he, faithful to his Lord, faithful to that God who employed him, did not fail from time to time to open his mouth against them, and to bear a noble testimony to the honor of that God in whose name he from time to time spake. If you will read his prophecy, you will find that none spake more against such ministers than Jeremiah. In the words of the text, in a more special manner, he exemplifies how they had dealt falsely, how they had behaved treacherously to poor souls. Says he, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. The prophet in the name of God had been denouncing war against the people. He had been telling them that their house should be left desolate and that the Lord would certainly visit the land with war. Therefore, says he in the eleventh verse, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad, and upon the assembly of young men together, for even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others, with their fields and wives together, for I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. The prophet gives a thundering message, that they might be terrified and have some convictions and inclinations to repent. But it seems that the false prophets, that the false priests, went about stifling people's convictions, and when they were hurt, or a little terrified, they were for daubing over the wound, telling them that Jeremiah was but an enthusiastic preacher, that there could be no such thing as war among them, and saying to people, Peace, peace, be still, when the prophet told them there was no peace. How many of us cry, Peace? peace to our souls when there is no peace how many are there who are now settled upon their lees that now think they are christians that now flatter themselves that they have an interest in jesus christ whereas if we come to examine their experiences we shall find that their peace is but a peace of the devil's making it is not a peace that passeth human understanding 
It is a matter, therefore, of great importance, my dear hearers, to know whether we may speak peace to our hearts. We are all desirous of peace. Peace is an unspeakable blessing. How can we live without peace? And therefore people from time to time must be taught how far they must go and what must be wrought in them before they can speak peace to their hearts. This is what I design at present, that I may deliver in my soul, that I may be free from the blood of all those to whom I preach, that I may not fail to declare the whole counsel of God. I shall, from the words of the text, endeavor to show you what you must undergo, and what must be wrought in you before you can speak peace to your hearts. But before I come directly to this, give me leave to premise a caution or two. And the first is that I take it for granted you believe religion to be an inward thing. You believe it to be a work in the heart, a work wrought in the soul by the power of the Spirit of God. If you do not believe this, you do not believe your Bibles. If you do not believe this, though you have got your Bibles in your hand, you hate the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. For religion is everywhere represented in Scripture as the work of God in the heart. The kingdom of God is within us, says our Lord, and he is not a Christian who is one outwardly, but he is a Christian who is one inwardly. If any of you place religion in outward things, I shall not, perhaps, please you this morning. You will understand me no more when I speak of the work of God upon a poor sinner's heart than if I were talking in an unknown tongue. First, then, before you can speak peace to your hearts, you must be made to see, made to feel, made to weep over, made to bewail your actual transgressions against the law of God. According to the covenant of works, the soul that sinneth it shall die. Cursed is that man, be he what he may, be he who he may, that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. We are not only to do some things, but we are to do all things. And we are to continue so to do, so that the least deviation from the moral law, according to the covenant of works, whether in thought, word, or deed, deserves eternal death at the hand of God. And if one evil thought, if one evil word, if one evil action deserves eternal damnation, how many hells, my friends, do every one of us deserve, whose whole lives have been one continued rebellion against God? Before ever, therefore, you can speak peace to your hearts, you must be brought to see, brought to believe what a dreadful thing it is to depart from the living God. And now, my dear friends, examine your hearts, for I hope you came hither with a design to have your souls made better. Give me leave to ask you in the presence of God whether you know the time, and if you do not know exactly the time, do you know there was a time when God wrote bitter things against you, when the arrows of the Almighty were within you? Were ever the remembrance of your sins grievous to you? Was the burden of your sins intolerable to your thoughts? Did you ever see that God's wrath might justly fall upon you on account of your actual transgressions against God? Were you ever in all your life sorry for your sins? Could you ever say, My sins are gone over my head as a burden too heavy for me to bear? Did you ever experience any such thing as this? Did ever any such thing as this pass between God and your soul? If not, for Jesus Christ's sake, do not call yourselves Christians. You may speak peace to your hearts, but there is no peace. May the Lord awaken you, may the Lord convert you, may the Lord give you peace, if it be His will, before you go home. Did you ever feel and experience this, any of you, to justify God in your damnation? To own that you are by nature children of wrath, and that God may justly cut you off, though you never actually offended Him in all your life? If you were ever truly convicted, if your hearts were ever truly cut, if self were truly taken out of you, you would be made to see and feel this. And if you have never felt the weight of original sin, do not call yourselves Christians. I am verily persuaded original sin is the greatest burden of a true convert. This ever grieves the regenerate soul, the sanctified soul. The indwelling of sin in the heart is the burden of a converted person. It is the burden of a true Christian. He continually cries out, O oh, who will deliver me from this body of death? this indwelling corruption in my heart. This is that which disturbs a poor soul most. And therefore, if you never felt this inward corruption, if you never saw that God might justly curse you for it, indeed, my dear friends, you may speak peace to your hearts. But I fear, nay, I know, there is no true peace. After we are renewed, yet we are renewed, but in part, indwelling sin continues in us, there is a mixture of corruption in every one of our duties, so that after we are converted, were Jesus Christ only to accept us according to our works, our works would damn us. 
for we cannot put up a prayer, but it is far from that perfection which the moral law requireth. I do not know what you may think, but I can say that I cannot pray, but I sin. I cannot preach to you or to any others, but I sin. I can do nothing without sin, as one expresseth it. My repentance wants to be repented of, and my tears to be washed in the precious blood of my dear Redeemer. Our best duties are as so many splendid sins. Before you can speak peace to your heart, you must not only be sick of your original and actual sin, but you must be made sick of your righteousness, of all your duties and performances. There must be a deep conviction before you can be brought out of your self-righteousness. It is the last idol taken out of our heart. The pride of our heart will not let us submit to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But if you never felt that you had no righteousness of your own, if you never felt the deficiency of your own righteousness, you cannot come to Jesus Christ. But then, before you can speak peace to your souls, there is one particular sin you must be greatly troubled for. And yet, I fear, there are few of you think what it is. It is the reigning, the damning sin of the Christian world, and yet the Christian world seldom or never think of it. And pray, what is that? It is what most of you think you are not guilty of, and that is the sin of unbelief. Before you can speak peace to your heart, you must be troubled for the unbelief of your heart. Before it can be supposed that any of you are unbelievers here in this churchyard that are born in Scotland, in a reformed country, that go to church every Sabbath, can any of you that receive the sacrament once a year, oh, that it were administered oftener, can it be supposed that you who had tokens for the sacrament, that you who keep up family prayer, that any of you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? My friends, we mistake a historical faith for a true faith, wrought in the heart by the Spirit of God. You fancy you believe because you believe there is such a book as we call the Bible. Because you go to church, all this you may do and have no true faith in Christ. Merely to believe there was such a person as Christ, merely to believe there is a book called the Bible, will do you no good more than to believe there was such a man as Caesar or Alexander the Great. The Bible is a sacred depository. What thanks have we to give to God for those lively oracles? But yet we may have these and not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. My dear friends, there must be a principle wrought in the hearts by the Spirit of the living God. Did I ask you how long it is since you believed in Jesus Christ? I suppose most of you would tell me you believed in Jesus Christ as long as ever you remember. You never did misbelieve. Then you could not give me a better proof that you never yet believed in Jesus Christ unless you were sanctified early as from the womb. For they that otherwise believe in Christ know there was a time they did not believe in Jesus Christ. You say you love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. If I were to ask you how long it is since you loved God, you would say as long as you can remember. You never hated God. You know no time when there was enmity in your heart against God. Then unless you were sanctified very early, you never loved God in your life. My dear friends, I am more particular in this because it is a most deceitful delusion whereby so many people are carried away that they believe already. Therefore it is remarked of Mr. Marshall giving account of his experiences that he had been working for life and he had ranged all his sins under the Ten Commandments and then, coming to a minister, asked him the reason why he could not get peace. The minister looked to his catalogue. Away, says he, I do not find one word of the sin of unbelief in all your catalogue. It is the peculiar work of the Spirit of God to convince us of our unbelief, that we have got no faith. Says Jesus Christ, I will send the Comforter, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of the sin of unbelief. Of sin, says Christ, because they believe not on me. I am now talking of the invisible realities of another world, of inward religion, of the work of God upon a poor sinner's heart. I am now talking of a matter of great importance, my dear hearers. You are all concerned in it. Your souls are concerned in it. Your eternal salvation is concerned in it. You may be all at peace, but perhaps the devil has lulled you asleep into a carnal lethargy and security, and will endeavor to keep you there till he get you to hell, and there you will be awakened, but it will be dreadful to be awakened, and find yourself so fearfully mistaken when the great gulf is fixed, when you will be calling to all eternity for a drop of water to cool your tongue, and shall not obtain it. End of section 21. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 22 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. To His Army Before Quebec by James Wolfe. Footnote. Delivered on the Plains of Abraham before the battle, September 18, 1759. Wolfe's men had been drawn up in six battalions in first line facing Quebec, two battalions covering the left flank, one being held in reserve. In footnote. Born in 1727, died in 1759, served against the Scottish insurgents in 1745 to 1746, made a brigadier in 1758 commanded a division at Louisburg in 1758, made a major general in 1759, commanded the expedition to Quebec in the same year, and died on the Plains of Abraham in the hour of victory. 1759. I congratulate you, my brave countrymen and fellow soldiers, on the spirit and success with which you have executed this important part of our enterprise. The formidable heights of Abraham are now surmounted, and the city of Quebec, the object of all our toils, now stands in full view before us. A perfidious enemy, who have dared to exasperate you by their cruelties, but not to oppose you on equal ground, are now constrained to face you on the open plain, without ramparts or entrenchments to shelter them. You know too well the forces which compose their army to dread their superior numbers. A few regular troops from old France, weakened by hunger and sickness, who, when fresh, were unable to withstand the British soldiers, are their general's chief dependents. Those numerous companies of Canadians, insolent, mutinous, unsteady, and ill-disciplined, have exercised his utmost skill to keep them together to this time. And as soon as their irregular ardor is damped by one firm fire, they will instantly turn their backs and give you no further trouble but in the pursuit. As for those savage tribes of Indians, whose horrid yells in the forest have struck many a bold heart with affright, terrible as they are with a tomahawk and scalping knife to a flying and prostrate foe, you have experienced how little their ferocity is to be dreaded by resolute men upon fair and open ground. You can now only consider them as the just objects of a severe revenge for the unhappy fate of many slaughtered countrymen. This day puts it into your power to terminate the fatigues of a siege which has so long employed your courage and patience. Possessed with a full confidence of the certain success which British valor must gain over such enemies, I have led you up these steep and dangerous rocks, only solicitous to show you the foe within your reach. The impossibility of a retreat makes no difference in the situation of men resolved to conquer or die. And believe me, my friends, if your conquest could be bought with the blood of your general, he would most cheerfully resign a life which he has long devoted to his country. End of section 22. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 23 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. The Retort to Walpole by William Pitt, Earl of Chatham. Born in 1708, died in 1778, entered Parliament in 1735, attacked the government in 1755 and removed from office. Secretary of State in 1756 to 1757, again Secretary of State in the Coalition Ministry of 1757 to 1761, when he adopted vigorous measures in the Seven Years' War. Prime Minister in 1766, resigned on account of ill health in 1768, made his last appearance in Parliament in 1778. Footnote. This celebrated retort was made during the debate on Walpole's bill for the encouragement and increase of seamen. As here given, it was furnished by Dr. Johnson to the Gentleman's Magazine for November 1741. The phrasing of the retort in the main is undoubtedly Johnson's rather than Pitt's. Long after the date of the speech, someone mentioned it in Johnson's presence as superior to anything in Demosthenes whereupon Johnson declared, I wrote that speech in a garret in Exeter Street. The internal evidence bears him out, for in these reports, 
Pitt, Walpole, Halifax, and Newcastle all speak alike. But the ideas are, of course, those of Pitt. The reply was not made to Sir Robert Walpole, the Prime Minister, but to his brother, Horace Walpole the Elder, who, in answer to a speech Pitt had already made attacking Sir Robert's administration, had said, Formidable sound and furious declamation, confident assertions and lofty periods may affect the young and inexperienced, and perhaps the gentleman may have contracted his habits of oratory by conversing more with those of his own age than with such as have had more opportunities of acquiring knowledge and more successful methods of communicating their sentiments. If the heat of his temper, sir, would suffer him to attend to those whose age and long acquaintance with business give them an indisputable right to deference and superiority, he would learn in time to reason rather than to declaim, and to prefer justness of argument and an accurate knowledge of the facts to sounding epithets and splendid superlatives, which may disturb the imagination for a moment, but leave no lasting impression on the mind. He will learn, sir, that to accuse and give proof are very different, and that reproaches inspired by vindictiveness affect only the character of him that utters them. Excursions of fancy and flights of oratory are indeed pardonable in young men, but in no other. End footnote. 1741. The atrocious crime of being a young man, which the honorable gentleman has with such spirit and decency charged upon me, I shall neither attempt to palliate nor deny but content myself with wishing that I may be one of those whose follies may cease with their youth, and not of that number who are ignorant in spite of experience. Where the youth can be imputed to any man as a reproach, I will not, sir, assume the province of determining. But surely age may become justly contemptible, if the opportunities which it brings have passed away without improvement, and vice appears to prevail when the passions have subsided. The wretch, who, after having seen the consequences of a thousand errors, continues still to blunder, and whose age has only added obstinacy to stupidity, is surely the object of either abhorrence or contempt, and deserves not that his gray hair should secure him from insult. Much more, sir, is he to be abhorred, who, as he has advanced in age, has receded from virtue and become more wicked with less temptation, who prostitutes himself for money which he cannot enjoy, and spends the remains of his life in the ruin of his country. But youth, sir, is not my only crime. I have been accused of acting a theatrical part. A theatrical part may either imply some peculiarities of gesture, or a dissimulation of my real sentiments, and an adoption of the opinions and language of another man. In the first sense, sir, the charge is too trifling to be confuted, and deserves only to be mentioned to be despised. I am at liberty, like every other man, to use my own language, and, though I may perhaps have some ambition to please this gentleman, I shall not lay myself under any restraint, nor very solicitously copy his diction or his mien, however matured by age or modelled by experience. If any man shall, by charging me with theatrical behaviour, imply that I utter any sentiments but my own, I shall treat him as a calumniator and a villain, nor shall any protection shelter him from the treatment he deserves. I shall on such an occasion without scruple trample upon all those forms with which wealth and dignity entrench themselves, nor shall anything but age restrain my resentment, age which always brings one privilege, that of being insolent and supercilious without punishment. But with regard, sir, to those whom I have offended, I am of opinion that if I had acted a borrowed part I should have avoided their censure. The heat that offended them is the ardor of conviction and that zeal for the service of my country which neither hope nor fear shall influence me to suppress. I will not sit unconcerned while my liberty is invaded, nor look in silence upon public robbery. I will exert my endeavors at whatever hazard to repel the aggressor and drag the thief to justice, whoever may protect them in their villainy, and whoever may partake of their plunder. And if the honorable gentleman, at this point Pitt called to order by Winnington, sat down. In the course of his protest, Winnington said, I do not, sir, undertake to decide the controversy between the two gentlemen, but I must be allowed to observe that no diversity of opinion can justify the violation of decency and the use of rude and virulent expressions, expressions dictated only by resentment and uttered without regard to, whereupon Pitt jumped to his feet and called Winnington to order, saying, Sir, 
If this be to preserve order, there is no danger of indecency from the most licentious tongue. For what calumny can be more atrocious, or what reproach more severe, than that of speaking with regard to anything but truth? Order may sometimes be broken by passion or inadvertency, but will hardly be re-established by a monitor like this who cannot govern his own passion while he is restraining the impetuosity of others. Happy, sir, would it be for mankind if every one knew his own province. We should not then see the same man at once a criminal and a judge, nor would this gentleman assume the right of dictating to others what he has not learned himself. That I may return in some degree the favor which he intends me, I will advise him never hereafter to express himself on the subject of order, but whenever he feels inclined to speak on such occasions to remember how he has now succeeded, and condemn in silence what his censures will never reform. End of section 23 Recording by Philip Gould Section 24 of The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. On the Right to Tax America. By William Pitt, Earl of Chatham. Footnote. Delivered in the House of Commons, January 14, 1766 and reported by Sir Robert Dean and Lord Charlemagne, here slightly abridged. Pitt, partially recovered from his illness, had then just returned from Bath. Although in sympathy with the Rockingham Ministry, he had refused to become a member of it. In August of this year he was made a peer. End footnote. 1766. It is a long time, Mr. Speaker, since I have attended in Parliament. When the resolution was taken in this house to tax America, I was ill in bed. If I could have endured to be carried in my bed, so great was the agitation of my mind for the consequences, I would have solicited some kind hand to have laid me down on this floor, to have borne my testimony against it. It is now an act that has passed. Footnote. The Stamp Act had passed and become a law on March twenty second, 1765. Two weeks after Chatham spoke, Franklin was examined in the House of Commons. For Franklin's examination, see Volume 8. End footnote. I would speak with decency of every act of this House, but I must beg the indulgence of the House to speak of it with freedom. I hope a day may soon be appointed to consider the state of the nation with respect to America. I hope gentlemen will come to this debate with all the temper and impartiality that His Majesty recommends, and the importance of the subject requires. A subject of greater importance than ever engaged the attention of this House. That subject only accepted when, near a century ago, it was the question whether you yourselves were to be bond or free. In the meantime, as I cannot depend upon my health for any future day, such is the nature of my infirmities, I will beg to say a few words at present, leaving the justice, the equity, the policy, the expediency of the act to another time. I will only speak to one point, a point which seems not to have been generally understood. I mean to the right. Some gentlemen seem to have considered it as a point of honor. If gentlemen consider it in that light, they leave all measures of right and wrong, to follow a delusion that may lead to destruction. It is my opinion that this kingdom has no right to lay a tax upon the colonies. At the same time, I assert the authority of this kingdom over the colonies to be sovereign and supreme in every circumstance of government and legislation whatsoever. They are the subjects of this kingdom, equally entitled with yourselves to all the natural rights of mankind and the peculiar privileges of Englishmen, equally bound by its laws, and equally participating in the constitution of this free country. The Americans are the sons, not the bastards of England. Taxation is no part of the governing or legislative power. The taxes are a voluntary gift and grant of the commons alone. In legislation the three estates of the realm are alike concerned, but the concurrence of the peers and the crown to a tax is only necessary to clothe it with the form of a law. The gift and grant is of the commons alone. In ancient days the crown, the barons, and the clergy possessed the lands. In those days the barons and the clergy gave and granted to the crown. 
they gave and granted what was their own at present since the discovery of america and other circumstances permitting the commons are become the proprietors of the land the church god bless it has but a pittance the property of the lords compared with that of the commons is as a drop of water in the ocean and this house represents those commons the proprietors of the lands and those proprietors virtually represent the rest of the inhabitants when therefore in this house we give and grant we give and grant what is our own but in an american tax what do we do we your majesty's commons for great britain give and grant to your majesty what our own property no we give and grant to your majesty the property of your majesty's commons of america it is an absurdity in terms the distinction between legislation and taxation is essentially necessary to liberty the crown and the peers are equally legislative powers within the commons if taxation be a part of simple legislation the crown and the peers have rights in taxation as well as yourselves rights which they will claim which they will exercise whenever the principle can be supported by power there is an idea in some that the colonies are virtually represented in the house i would fain know by whom an american is represented here is he represented by any knight of the shire in any county in this kingdom would to god that respectable representation was augmented to a greater number or will you tell him that he is represented by any representative of a borough a borough which perhaps its own representatives never saw this is what is called the rotten part of the constitution it cannot continue a century if it does not drop it must be amputated the idea of a virtual representation of america in this house is the most contemptible idea that ever entered into the head of a man it does not deserve a serious refutation the commons of america represented in their several assemblies have ever been in possession of the exercise of this their constitutional right of giving and granting their own money they would have been slaves if they had not enjoyed it at the same time this kingdom as the supreme governing and legislative power has always bound the colonies by her laws by her regulations and restrictions in trade in navigation in manufactures in everything except that of taking their money out of their pockets without their consent as pitt sat down george grenville secured the floor and said i cannot understand the difference between external and internal taxes they are the same in effect and differ only in name that this kingdom has the sovereign the supreme legislative power over america is granted it cannot be denied and taxation is a part of that sovereign power it is one branch of the legislation it is it has been exercised over those who were not who were never represented it is exercised over the india company the merchants of london the proprietors of the stocks and over many great manufacturing towns it was exercised over the county palatine of chester and the bishopric of durham before they sent any representatives to parliament i appeal for proof to the preambles of the acts which gave them representatives one in the reign of henry the eighth the other in that of charles the second when i proposed to tax america i asked the house if any gentleman would object to the right i repeatedly asked it and no man would attempt to deny it protection and obedience are reciprocal great britain protects america america is bound to yield obedience if not tell me when the americans were emancipated when they want the protection of this kingdom they are always very ready to ask it that protection has always been afforded them in the most full and ample manner the nation has run herself into an immense debt to give them their protection and now when they are called upon to contribute a small share toward the public expense an expense arising from themselves they renounce your authority insult your officers and break out i might almost say into open rebellion the seditious spirit of the colonies owes its birth to the factions in this house gentlemen are careless of the consequences of what they say provided it answers the purposes of opposition we were told we trod on tender ground we were bid to expect disobedience what is this but telling the americans to stand out against the law to encourage their obstinacy with the expectation of support from hence let us only hold out a little they would say our friends will soon be in power ungrateful people of america 
Bounties have been extended to them. When I had the honor of serving the crown, while you yourselves were loaded with an enormous debt, you gave bounties on their lumber, on their iron, their hemp, and many other articles. You have relaxed in their favor the act of navigation, that palladium of the British commerce. And yet I have been abused in all the public papers as an enemy to the trade of America. I have been particularly charged with giving orders and instructions to prevent the Spanish trade, and thereby stopping the channel by which alone North America used to be supplied with cash for remittances to this country. I defy any man to produce any such orders or instructions. I discouraged no trade but what was illicit, what was prohibited by an act of Parliament. I desire a West India merchant, Mr. Long, well known in the city, a gentleman of character may be examined. He will tell you that I offered to do everything in my power to advance the trade of America. I was above giving an answer to anonymous calumnies, but in this place it becomes one to wipe off the aspersions. When Grenville ceased, several members got up to speak, though Pitt started to rise. The house became clamorous for Pitt, Pitt, so that the speaker was obliged to call them to order. I do not apprehend, said Pitt, I am speaking twice. I did expressly reserve a part of my subject in order to save the time of this house, but I am compelled to proceed in it. I do not speak twice, I only finish what I designedly left imperfect. But if the house is of a different opinion, far be it from me to indulge a wish of transgression against order. I am content, if it be your pleasure, to be silent. Here he paused. But the house shouted, Go on! Go on! And he proceeded. Gentlemen, sir, have been charged with giving birth to sedition in America. They have spoken their sentiments with freedom against this unhappy act, and that freedom has become their crime. Sorry I am to hear the liberty of speech in this house imputed as a crime, but the imputation shall not discourage me. It is a liberty I mean to exercise. No gentleman ought to be afraid to exercise it. It is a liberty by which the gentleman who calumniates it might have profited. He ought to have desisted from his project. The gentleman tells us America is obstinate. America is almost in open rebellion. I rejoice that America has resisted. Three millions of people, so dead to all the feelings of liberty as voluntarily to submit to be slaves, would have been fit instruments to make slaves of the rest. I come not here armed at all points with law cases and acts of Parliament, with the statute book doubled down in dog's ears to defend the cause of liberty. If I had, I myself would have cited the two cases of Chester and Durham. I would have cited them to show that even under former arbitrary reigns, parliaments were ashamed of taxing a people without their consent, and allowed them representatives. Why did the gentleman confine himself to Chester and Durham? He might have taken a higher example in Wales, Wales that never was taxed by parliament till it was incorporated. I would not debate a particular point of law with the gentleman. I know his abilities. I have been obliged to his diligent researches. But for the defense of liberty upon a general principle, upon a constitutional principle, it is a ground on which I stand firm, on which I dare meet any man. The gentleman tells us of many who are taxed and are not represented. The India Company, merchants, stockholders, manufacturers. Surely many of these are represented in other capacities as owners of land or as freemen of boroughs. It is a misfortune that more are not equally represented but they are all inhabitants, and as such are they not virtually represented? Many have it in their option to be actually represented. They have connections with those that elect, and they have influence over them. The gentleman mentioned the stockholders. I hope he does not reckon the debts of the nation as a part of the national estate. Since the accession of King William, many ministers, some of great, others of more moderate abilities, have taken the lead of government. None of these thought, or even dreamed, of robbing the colonies of their constitutional rights. That was reserved to mark the era of the late administration. Not that there were wanting some, when I had the honor to serve His Majesty, to propose to me to burn my fingers with an American Stamp Act. With the enemy at their back, with our bayonets at their breasts, in the day of their distress, perhaps the Americans would have submitted to the imposition. 
but it would have been taking an ungenerous and unjust advantage. The gentleman boasts of his bounties to America. Are not these bounties intended finally for the benefit of this kingdom? If not, he has misapplied the national treasures. I am no courtier of America. I stand up for this kingdom. I maintain that Parliament has a right to bind to restrain America. Our legislative power over the colonies is sovereign and supreme. When it ceases to be sovereign and supreme, I would advise every gentleman to sell his lands, if he can, and embark for that country. When two countries are connected together like England and her colonies, without being incorporated, the one must necessarily govern. The greater must rule the less. But she must so rule it as not to contradict the fundamental principles that are common to both. If the gentleman does not understand the difference between external and internal taxes, I cannot help it. There is a plain distinction between taxes levied for the purposes of raising a revenue and duties imposed for the regulation of trade, for the accommodation of the subject, although in the consequences some revenue may incidentally arise from the latter. The gentleman asks, when were the colonies emancipated? I desire to know when were they made slaves, but I dwell not upon words. When I had the honor of serving His Majesty, I availed myself of the means of information which I derived from my office. I speak, therefore, from knowledge. My materials were good. I was at pains to collect, to digest, to consider them. And I will be bold to affirm that the profits to Great Britain from the trade of the colonies through all its branches is two millions a year. This is the fund that carried you triumphantly through the last war. Footnote. The war with France which, in its American phase, virtually ended with the victory of Wolfe at Quebec in 1759. End footnote. The estates that were rented at two thousand pounds a year threescore years ago are at three thousand at present. Those estates sold then from fifteen to eighteen years' purchase. The same may now be sold for thirty. You owe this to America. This is the price America pays you for her protection. And shall a miserable financier come with a boast that he can bring a peppercorn into the exchequer by the loss of millions to the nation? I dare not say how much higher these profits may be augmented. Omitting the immense increase of people by natural population in the northern colonies, and the immigration from every part of Europe, I am convinced on other grounds that the commercial system of America may be altered to advantage. You have prohibited where you ought to have encouraged you have encouraged where you ought to have prohibited. Improper restraints have been laid on the continent in favor of the islands. You have but two nations to trade with in America. Would you had twenty. Let acts of Parliament in consequence of treaties remain. But let not an English minister become a custom-house officer for Spain or for any foreign power. Much is wrong. Much may be amended for the general good of the whole. Does the gentleman complain he has been misrepresented in the public prints? It is a common misfortune. In the Spanish affair of the last war I was abused in all the newspapers for having advised His Majesty to violate the laws of nations with regard to Spain. The abuse was industriously circulated even in handbills. If administration did not propagate the abuse, administration never contradicted it. I will not say what advice I did give the king. My advice is in writing, signed by myself in the possession of the crown. But I will say what advice I did not give to the king. I did not advise him to violate any of the laws of nations. The gentleman must not wonder he was not contradicted when, as minister, he asserted the right of Parliament to tax America. I know not how it is, but there is a modesty in this house which does not choose to contradict a minister. Even your chair, sir, looks too often towards St. James. I wish gentlemen would get the better of this modesty. If they do not, perhaps the collective body may begin to abate of its respect for the representative. Lord Bacon has told me that a great question would not fail of being agitated at one time or another. I was willing to agitate such a question at the proper season, viz. that of the German War. Footnote. The Seven Years' War, or as it is sometimes called, the Third Silesian War of Frederick the Great. End footnote. My German war, they called it. Every session I called out, has anybody any objection to the German war? Nobody would object to it. 
one gentleman only excepted since removed to the upper house by succession to an ancient barony. He told me he did not like a German war. I honored the man for it, and was sorry when he was turned out of his post. A great deal has been said without doors of the power and of the strength of America. It is a topic that ought to be cautiously meddled with. In a good cause, on a sound bottom, the force of this country can crush America to atoms. I know the valor of your troops. I know the skill of your officers. There is not a company of foot that has served in America, out of which you may not pick a man of sufficient knowledge and experience to make a governor of a colony there. But on this ground, on the Stamp Act which so many here will think a crying injustice, I am one who will lift up my hands against it. In such a cause your success would be hazardous. America, if she fell, would fall like the strong man. She would embrace the pillars of the state and pull down the Constitution along with her. Is this your boasted peace? Not to sheathe the sword in its scabbard, but to sheathe it in the bowels of your countrymen? Will you quarrel with yourselves, now the whole house of Bourbon is united against you, while France disturbs your fisheries in Newfoundland? embarrasses your slave trade to africa and withholds from your subjects in canada their property stipulated by treaty while the ransom for the manillas is denied by spain and its gallant conqueror basely traduced into a mean plunderer a gentleman whose noble and generous spirit would do honor to the proudest grandee of the country the americans have not acted in all things with prudence and temper they have been wronged they have been driven to madness by injustice Will you punish them for the madness you have occasioned? Rather let prudence and temper come first from this side. I will undertake for America that she will follow the example. There are two lines in a ballad of priors of a man's behavior to his wife, so applicable to you in your colonies that I cannot help repeating them. Be to her faults a little blind. Be to her virtues very kind. Upon the whole I will beg leave to tell the house what is my opinion. It is that the Stamp Act be repealed absolutely, totally, and immediately. That the reason for the repeal be assigned, viz. because it was founded on an erroneous principle. At the same time let the sovereign authority of this country over the colonies be asserted in as strong terms as can be devised, and be made to extend to every point of legislation whatsoever, that we may bind their trade, confine their manufactures, and exercise every power whatsoever, except that of taking money from their pockets without consent. End of section 24. Recording by Philip Gould.